So this lesson will discuss how to identify geothermal resources using geology and geochemistry processes. The corresponding chapter to this lesson is chapter six in the Glassley book. And the motivation for learning this topic is to explore the ways engineers and geologists identify possible geothermal energy sites. First, we're gonna talk about the different types of geological settings used to identify geothermal resources. While some geothermal sources produce obvious surface manifestations, such as geysers, boiling mud pots, steaming pools, and fumaroles, others leave no physical mark on the surface, and they're called hidden resources, where they require more in-depth studying, such as geochemical, geophysical, and statistical techniques to help assess the region's thermal resources. Some of the obvious surface manifestations are seen in the forms of fumaroles and boiling mud pots. The first picture shows a fumarole in Iceland, which is a crack in the crust that emits steam and gases. One of these gases in particular is sulfur, and it emits a easily identifiable egg-like smell. Um, another one that you can see in the second picture is a boiling mud pot, where it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just a giant pot of, or a giant, hole of intensely heated mud that um, is so hot that it starts to boil. And this one, this picture was taken in the Lassen Volcanic National Park in Northeastern California. So um, getting into the exploration processes, once a resource is identified, the process of further exploration has to begin. The engineers and geoscientists come in and start analyzing existing geological information such as geologic maps, drill records, and other surface features in order to identify a target region on which to perform the more in-depth field studies, which come in the form of geochemical and geophysical surveys. And even more advanced, the aeromagnetic resistivity and remote sensing, which cost a lot of money and involve very complex types of sensors and drilling. So we, to classify the geothermal environments, there are obviously the active geothermal resources that are known to possess active geothermal potential in these are usually found in volcanically active regions and geyser fields and just obvious places where there is heated water underground. Um, although some regions do not possess these visibly active heat source reservoirs, such as Imperial Valley, California, and that is when we need to get into the geophysical surveys to determine whether regions have the potential for geothermal exploration. One way to classify these geothermal systems is by the Brophy type physiographic feature classification system. It's divided into types of systems A, B, C, D, and E, and F. They are classified based on their topography, the depth that the resource is located at from the surface, different surface manifestations itself, and the permeability of the rock. This classification system was developed by the former president of the Geothermal Resources Council, Paul Brophy, and the whole point is to focus on the physiographic features rather than the structural features. So the first type, the first type of structure is the isolated continental volcanic centers and they are called Brophy type A. These are typically active or recently active volcanic systems that are geographically separate from other volcanic systems, which means they are isolated. And they're not connected in a giant volcanic chain such as Hawaii. Diverse types of volcanic rock systems and their surface manifestations come in the form of hot springs and pools in mountainous regions. These resources are usually buried at a moderate to deep level underground and they are not too common source of geothermal energy. Uh, the picture that I've chosen to show is from El Chicon Volcano in Mexico and you can see that there are some obvious surface manifestations such as the steam geysers and hot spring.
So the Andesitic volcano, type B, is a geothermal resource that is abundant in mountainous regions in close proximity to ocean basins. Andesite volcanoes are considered to have excellent potential for geothermal resource development. They are found at moderate depths between 2,000 meters to greater than 4,000 meters, which is considered a deep resource. They form stratovolcanoes, which is like the obvious surface manifestation. These stratovolcanoes are tall and conical in shape. They are the classic type of volcano that everyone thinks of when they think volcanoes, such as Mount Fuji in Japan. Some hazards of these andesitic volcanoes are large ash eruptions, avalanches, and extreme earthquakes. Down below, we have just a schematic of a stratovolcano erupting, where it forms a crater, the lava flows out, and there's a the conical shape and the steam and ash that can act as a hazard of being around these surface manifestations. Brophy type C is called a caldera, and they are typically magma reservoirs of a large volcano that has erupted through a series of large eruptions, and the empty magma reservoir has then collapsed, forming that central depression surrounded by a circle of higher topography. The depth that the geothermal resources are typically found is within 2,000 meters of the surface, and that's considered a sh relatively shallow depth resource. And these resources are usually found in close proximity to the collapsed portion of the caldera on either side of the elevated ring. The permeability of the ground itself is low to moderate, with the exception of along the fracture lines associated with the collapse. The example that I've chosen to show is the Anacheck caldera in Alaska, and you can see it has that very distinctive circular shape with the collapsed reservoir in the middle. Sometimes, with increasing geothermal activity at the center, the central depression can actually raise and form into a central dome due to the higher pressure and temperature forming once again under the central depression. So Brophy type D is the fault bounded sedimentary basin. This sedimentary basin can also house geothermal resources typically along the fault lines that break through the crust and form passageways for the inner heat to reach the surface. Recent magma activity signals an excellent geothermal potential due to the high permeability caused by the faults and the fact that the sedimentary basin may be filled with layers of high permeability such as porous sandstone. The surface manifestations typical for these sedimentary basins are lava flows, steaming ground, and hot springs. And the resources are typically found at depths of over 2,500 meters which would be considered a moderate depth. This is an example of a fault-bounded sedimentary basin in Cerro Preto, Mexico. So this is a cross-section of a fault-bounded sedimentary basin, type D, that we previously talked about. This demonstrates the presence of the magma bed below a brittle transitional zone that acts as earthquake hypocenters. And a crack in that brittle rock allows the magma to flow from the bed up to the sedimentary basin layer where it can mix with the groundwaters and generate geothermal energy potential. Um, Brophy type E is a fault bounded extensional complex. Um, the fault bounded extensional complex and the fault bounded sedimentary complexes are considered very similar but different enough that they have been classified into type D and E. So these extensional complexes are formed of horse and grabens, where a horse is a flat top ridge and a graben is a flat bottom valley. These formations occur in areas with extensive thinning of the crust, where the crust is pulled apart, causing steep vertical fracturing, creating fluid flow pathways for the geothermal fluid to rise to the surface. You can see um, I have a few diagrams of what a horse and graben is. Um, it's when the mantle itself starts pulling away and the fault lines start to sink 
forming the Grobbins, which is the valleys, and the horse, which is the upper region. The figure 6.5 shows the cross-sectional diagram of the fluid flow pathways in a horse and Grobbin formation. You can see that these fluid flow pathways, the fluid flows up through the cracks within the fault that um, have formed the Horst and Grobman formation. And this schematic shows the flow around the fault line of a Horst and Grobman. The surface water flows downhill with gravity into the fault zone at the base of the mountains where the water descends further and is heated by the buried heat source. The buoyancy forces allow the heated water to return back to the surface and emerge as hot springs. The temperature of these hot springs is directly related to the proximity of the spring to that heat source. The final type within the Brophy classification is the ocean basaltic provinces. As hinted by the name, ocean basaltic provinces, geothermal sources occur in island chains and archipelagos that are relatively young volcanic systems. The main surface manifestation is the outpouring of the basaltic lava from the heat source, and these Geothermal resources are typically located at a shallow depth between 1,000 to 2,000 meters below the surface. The primary surface manifestation of these ocean basaltic provinces is the massive outpouring of basaltic lava. The example that I have shown is the Reunion Island on the Indian Ocean. Knowing these physiographical features are likely to be present can help focus exploration efforts. Once a geothermal system has been observed and its type has been identified, a more detailed and focused exploration efforts can be initiated. In addition to the geophysical surveys, which focus primarily on the physiographic features, fluid geochemistry is another analytical process to aid in the exploration and discovery of potential geothermal energy resources. Many geothermal features can contain under an underground water system where the water interacts and adopts the chemical isotopic characteristics of the surrounding geology. The water's origin can be deduced from its chemical and isotopic characteristics, and these chemical signatures can be used to assess the history and properties of the potential geothermal site, such as determining whether it is a juvenile resource or an old resource that is starting to degrade. These underground waters exhibit a broad range of elemental compositions, the geothermal fluids mix with the existing groundwaters that have interacted with a broad range of geological environments. Meteorological water is water generated by meteor meteorological processes such as rain or snowmelt. This water recharges local streams and lakes, and the free flow of these waters is favored by regions of high permeability, such as along fault lines and calderas. This subsurface water contains the dissolved minerals from the rock and will pick up other characteristics of the rock based on its temperature history in the case of geothermal. This is a schematic diagram of the fluid flow regime in a volcanic geothermal system. The heat source is represented by the orange and the steam zones are in light blue. While the condensation resulting from this cooling steam as it nears the surface is represented by the dark blue. Some surface manifestations can be seen in fumaroles and hot springs, and the flow path of this meteor meteoric water is shown by the heavy dashed lines, and you can see that it is a circular pattern where it sinks to the bottom due to gravity, and the water becomes buoyant once again through heat and is circulated out through the outflow region, forming these chloride springs or fumaroles or condensation zones. Deep circulation of meteoric water is favored by zones of high permeability. This results in the generation of geothermal waters, which require a heat source such as a magma body, a thin crust, or a granite rock rich in radioactive elements. As the water heats up, the density will decrease and it will tend to form a circulation pattern that is typical of a convection cell. These waters contain minerals and elemental traces unique to magma and act as an indication of a geothermal resource. As the water heats up, density decreases and a circulatory pattern of a convection cell forms. This convection cell is what allows the water to chemically interact with the rock. 
When the fluids emerge at the surface, they form surface manifestations such as springs at different temperatures, depending on the type of the heat source, the distance from the heat source, and the fluid flow circulation path itself. These chemically complex waters form if the underground water interacts with fluids that escaped from the crystallizing magma, or also known as molten rock. This magma contains gases and water that will dissolve in the melt. As the rock hardens, the gases that are incompatible with the crystallizing structure of the hardening magma will concentrate in the remaining melt. Examples of these gases are hydrogen sulfide, hydrochloric acid, carbon dioxide, and helium. The remaining melt will reach a, a certain saturation level, and the gases will migrate out of the melt into the surrounding rock formations, also called country rock. This is how the circulating groundwaters are able to pick up these trace gas elements, and these elements can be tested for in the groundwater to see if there is a potential geothermal resource in the surrounding location. The chemistry surrounding the geochemical testing is complicated, and a more in-depth look can be found in Chapter 6 of Glassley. The chapter goes into further detail about the isotopic traces and the equations and analytical procedures used to determine the suitability of a geothermal resource. I believe this is out of the scope of this presentation, but I encourage you to read more about it yourself. So in conclusion, there are numerous techniques that must be employed to locate a decent geothermal resource. We first must begin with using the available geological and physiological information from existing drill records or geographical surveys. We then must test the groundwater for geochemical traces of magmatic gases and isotopic presence. In addition to the geochemical traces, we must also include the geothermal evidence to establish the ideal reservoir temperatures. The isotopic analysis is used to identify anomalies within the groundwater and it indicates interactions with a the thermal source and also allows us to gain information about temperature, fluid sources, and fluid mixing. Locating a geothermal resource is not as simple as just pointing at a hot spring and assuming there's going to be sufficient geothermal energy to power an energy plant or process steam or produce heat. So we must use these geological, physiological, and geochemical processes to analyze the potential and determine whether it will be a suitable geothermal resource for use.